The really interesting thing about fasting nowadays with all the research that's out there is we have enough data to cherry pick which length of fast we want to do for a specific goal that we have. In other words, if fat loss is your goal, you can cherry pick a specific length of fast to institute the best result with that. Or if brain energy is a goal, you can pick a length of fast for that, or longevity, or sleep patterns, or muscle building. So in this video, we'll discover the best length of fast for a specific goal. We'll start with fat loss, the specific fast that you can do for fat loss. Then we'll move into a, a tool that you can use to restore your circadian rhythm if you haven't been sleeping well. Then we'll talk about a fast that you can use to build muscle, what length of fast is good for that. Then we'll talk about the length of fast that are good for overall lifespan and longevity. Then we're gonna talk about what length of fast are going to be the best to bolster your immune system. And lastly, we will talk about which length of fast is best to get the best cognitive function and brain energy if you have a specific task that you need to line up for or anything like that. So before I get into all this, please do hit that red subscribe button. We are the leading intermittent fasting channel, so I want to make sure that you hit that subscribe button so you never miss a beat. And also hit that little bell icon. That way you get a little push notification every single time we go live with a new video or any kind of live broadcast. Okay, so let's start with the fat loss side of things. There's an interesting study that was published in the journal Nutrient Review. Okay, it took a look at 21 different fasting related studies and formed what's called a meta-analysis to ultimately determine which length of fast was best for fat burning, at least amongst these three. So it took a look at daily time-restricted feeding, which was kind of the quintessential 16-hour fast, 8-hour eating window kind of thing. Thing we're kind of all adjusted to or used to. That was looking at it daily. Then it compared it to alternate day fasting, where it would have people eat uh, relatively normal meals one day and then totally fast the next day, and alternate, just like the name implies, alternate day fasting. And then lastly, it looked at whole day fasting, which is where subjects would eat ad libitum, whatever they wanted, but two or three days a week, they would aggressively fast for 24 to 36 hours. So basically, very infrequent, longer, more intense fasts. Well, the best results as far as fat loss was concerned came from the alternate day fasting group. Okay, they lost on average three to 5% total body weight and three to 5.5 kilograms of fat mass. That's pretty solid. Second place was the whole day fasting, which was pretty cool because that's, I don't know, hasn't really been looked at before. And that is a lot more of my strategy. I've always been a big fan of doing longer term fasts somewhat infrequently and getting a more aggressive result that way. And then of course, the intermittent fasting on a daily regimen had good success too, just marginally worse than the others. However, there was a study that was published in the journal Translational Medicine that reinforced that time-restricted feeding, the shorter fasts that are a little bit more frequent, alongside heavy resistance training, resulted in a 16% decrease in body fat mass. So that indicates that in the right scenario, daily intermittent fasting could be really effective. I'm not the biggest fan of daily intermittent fasting because I feel that daily you start to slow your metabolism down. But the biggest benefit from intermittent fasting more frequently with shorter fasts is going to be the hunger side of things. So there's a study that was published in Molecular and Cellular Endocrinology that demonstrated that intermittent fasting resulted in less hunger over time the more that someone fasted. So here's what we've gathered from this fat loss section here. Alternate day fasting is going to get you the most aggressive fat loss result. But is it practical to fast every other day? Not necessarily, that's a little intense, okay? But that's gonna get you the best fat loss. Daily intermittent fasting is great for those of you that know that your biggest hurdle to weight loss is hunger. If hunger is something that you battle with and it could just be who you are, then intermittent fasting more frequently with shorter fasts, not necessarily da daily, but more frequently, could be the way for you. If you're someone that just doesn't like to think about it and you just like to be either on or off, then the whole day fasting a few days per week might be a good, good strategy because it allows you to just be relaxed and then a couple days per week just aggressively fast and voila. Okay, now this next one we're gonna move into is sort of a tool that you can have in your toolbox. Okay, this is if you've had like a rough night of sleep or if you've been stressed out and your sleep's all messed up, it's kind of a tool more than anything. Journal Nutrients published a study and they found that when subjects would have their eating window between 8 a.m. and 2 p.m., so shifted earlier in the morning, they actually reset six out of eight of their body clocks, of their clock genes. 
So what that indicates is that by eating in the morning for our time-restricted feeding versus later in the day, it's a good strategy to reset your clock. And the reason behind that is insulin. Okay, It makes more sense for us to have an insulin spike in the morning because that's going to be more in line with what we would just be doing as humans. We're awake when it's sun's coming up and we eat and we spike our insulin. Yada, yada, there you go. So it only takes about four days before you start to see an effect in how that resets your circadian rhythm. Plus you get an added benefit of what's called CERT1, just a longevity gene. I'm not gonna talk about that right now. Point is, use this no matter what kind of fast you typically do, if you just need to reset your body clock a little bit to recover from some poor sleep or something like that. Okay, so if you wanna build muscle now, this one's pretty straightforward. The length of fast isn't as important as is the time of day that you work out and break your fast. So what I mean by that is you should be trying to work out towards the end of your fast and have your break fast meal be post-workout. So what that means is tailor your fast to whenever you work out so that you're working out at the end of your fast. If you work out in the morning, then maybe you should fast from morning to morning so you're breaking your fast in the morning. That way you get the maximum amount of insulin sensitivity so you're getting the maximum amount of protein and nutrient absorption at the end of your workout, post-workout, plus at the end of a fast. Hugely beneficial. This is where I'll go ahead and recommend ButcherBox, by the way, too. I always recommend breaking a fast with good, lean, clean protein. ButcherBox has grass-fed, grass-finished meat. They've got some tremendous lean meat sources. They are a meat delivery company that has very, very high quality meat. They are what I use personally. They're a big supporter of this channel, so a huge thank you to them. Plus, anyone that watches my channel can utilize them via the special link down below. So if you wanna check out ButcherBox, I highly recommend you do. There's a link down below in the description. Check them out after you watch this video. Now moving into the longevity piece, and full disclaimer, like you can use these however you want. If you're in fat loss mode, great. If you want an extra spurt of longevity benefit, then great, you can implement this. So the longer the fast, the better. Let's just say that for longevity, to an extent. I don't like to push it longer than 72 hours unless you're going for a specific reason. There are some additional benefits, but really 72 hours is all you really need for an extended prolonged fast. The longer the fast, the better, and it generally just has to do with what are called ketones and something called histone deacetylase inhibitions. So this is where ketones, which are just produced because you're fasting for a longer period of time, doesn't mean you're doing a keto diet, doesn't mean any of that. It just means when you're fasting for a long period of time, you're no longer bringing in food, so your body starts to run on ketones. Well, in addition to being a fuel source, these ketones are actually a signaling device as well. And what that means is they act upon specific things. So when they act as what is called a histone deacetylase inhibitor, they basically make it so that your genes can get acted upon easier. Uh, the way that I've referenced it before is the longer the fast and the more ketones that you have available, the more access you have to your body's internal inherent library. If you have a library of your genetic blueprints and you can only access one part of the library, you're not living to your genetic potential. And a high abundance of ketones via a longer fast opens the doors to the other areas of your library so you can express more of your genes. This is a very important thing. So anything over sort of 24, 36 hours falls into the longevity category. So if you're going for that goal, then that's definitely what you want there. Of course you get fat loss benefit too. Now in terms of frequency with these, you may want to consider just doing two to three longer fasts per month if you're not doing other forms of fasting. So if longevity is only your goal and you just like to periodically fast, two, maybe three, two-day fasts a month are perfect. Every other week, do a 48-hour fast, and you've got massive, massive longevity benefit, some fat loss benefit, but you're not jumping on the full fasting bandwagon. You're just doing it periodically for health benefit. Next up is fasting for the immune system, which is weird, okay? Because fasting, by its very nature, is actually immunosuppressive. It actually crushes your immune system in a pretty bad way. Studies have indicated that you have impaired white blood cells, impaired T cell function, and it's a great way to get sick because you're stressing yourself out. But over the long term, what it does hormetically and how it conditions your body is actually very good for your immune system. So it's been shown that a 72 hour fast increases white blood cell proliferation. So you get new white blood cells, a new balance of white blood cells, which are fresh and able to fight off illness. Okay, additionally, when you're fasting longer term, the white blood cells that do actually go down don't necessarily go away. They go down because they rehome in the marrow. And when they rehome and get stored in the marrow, they actually rejuvenate. It's like you're going home and going to sleep. They're recharging their batteries. So while you're fasting, you're immunosuppressed. But after the fast, 
And if you do it consistently, then you develop some really good immunobenefit. Here's the catch. Longer fasts, 24 to 72 hours. Do them during summer months when there's not a bunch of different illnesses going around. Do it when you have the least likelihood of contracting an illness. Because the worst thing that you could do is be fasting for your immune system and then contract something. And that's just going to ruin all the effects, right? So try to aim that towards times when you're not going to be around a lot of people, when you know you can control it, when you know you're hormetically sealed and you can just get that benefit. The last one that I want to talk about is fasting for brain energy, fasting for a brain benefit. And this is more of a strategy, okay? I use this in practical applications when I'm working with uh, first responders or I'm working with military, anything like that, where they need specific strategy for brain performance. What you typically want to do is do one day of low carb or keto and then go into a 24 hour fast. Your cognitive performance is going to peak midway through your fasting day. So time it accordingly. If you have a test the next day, then you might, or if you have a test that you know is coming up, then you want to make sure you go two days ahead of time. You do keto, really low carb one day, and then move into a fast the next day. What this is going to do is it's going to allow the ketone production to be maximized. Okay, and ketones alone are going to be great brain fuel, but it's also going to upregulate something called brain-derived nootropic factor, BDNF. BDNF in and of itself helps grow neurons, it helps grow neural connections. But in addition to that, it has an effect on GLUT3 transporters and allows more specific glucose that's already available in your body to get shunted into your brain, or shuttled into your brain rather, so you get a more concrete, quick effect of glucose in the brain. So super powerful for that effect. So if you're trying to target brain energy, then yes, a 24 hour fast, but prefaced with a short keto stint. So as always, please keep it locked in here on my channel. If you want more of these types of videos, just comment down below in the area. And also don't forget to check out ButcherBox down below in the description. See you soon.